Good evening, Garden City. I'd like to call to order the regular scheduled council meeting for Monday, October 24th, 2022 at 7 p.m. Our first order of business is our opening ceremony, which consists of the national anthem, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, followed by a moment of silence for those service members that have given their lives while defending our country. Would everybody please stand? You please be seated. Mr. Miller, you take the roll call, please. Mayor Walker. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Squire. Here. Councilmember DeMichael. Here. Councilmember Earl. Here. Councilmember Jacobs. Here. Councilmember Lynch. Here. Councilmember Karakotas. Here. You do have a quorum with all seven members present. Thank you, sir. Moving on to item four, approval of the agenda. Mayor. Council Member Lynch. I move for the approval of the revised agenda for Monday, October 24th, 2022 at seven o'clock p.m. is presented. Support. Support from Council Member DeMichael. Any comments from the table? From the general public? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes 7-0. Okay, we're going to move on to item five. We have some swearing in tonight of a firefighter and a police officer. I'm going to call up uh, the fire chief, uh, Kathy Harmon, first. Hi, good evening, council, mayor, uh, city manager, Mr. Matt Miller, the clerk. Very happy tonight. We're getting to swear in a uh, new member of our department. His name is William Abraham. William was born and raised in Trenton. He graduated from uh, high school in Trenton, and right after graduation, he enlisted in the United States uh, Marine Corps. He served as an aircraft uh, rescue firefighter. He attended the Garland Fire Academy, Lewis F. Garland Academy in uh, San Antonio, Tex Texas. Uh, when he was stationed in the Marine Corps at, sta uh, at Station uh, Beaufort, where he served the remaining three years as an aircraft firefighter. During this time, he went and received his hazmat training. Uh, he served a total of four years. He's had an honorable discharge uh, in January of 2020. When he came home, he went to EMT school, and he became a licensed EMT paramedic, and he worked in a uh, private sector for a little while while they were um, getting his uh, reciprocal agreement so he could get his fire one and two. Then he enrolled at Dorsey uh, Paramedic School. He's been working in Flat Rock. That's where he met uh, Captain Ray. And during this time, part of their training, they have to uh, ride at different fire departments. There's a certain amount of hours you have to ride on a rescue, certain amount of clinical hours inside of a hospital. So he had an opportunity to ride a few different departments and he chose us. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, Tonight, uh, his mother is going to be pinning his badge on him after he gets sworn in from Mr. Matt Miller. But I wanted to recognize his father is here, uh, uh, William Sr., his little brother Braden, his sister Miranda, his grandmother Linda, and his mother over here is um, Karen. Um, some of the on-duty and off-duty guys are here. And I'm so happy all the police officers came out so that we could swear in our firemen. <laughs> 
So, uh, William, we also call him Billy. Would you come on up? I, William Abraham, I, William Abraham, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear, to perform my duty, to perform my duty, as a firefighter, as a firefighter, for the city of Garden City, for the city of Garden City, to the best of my ability, to the best of my ability, to serve the citizens of the city of Garden City, to serve the citizens of the city of Garden City, with compassion, courage, and integrity, with compassion, courage, and integrity, to serve my commanding officers, to serve my commanding officers, with respect and dignity, with respect and dignity, to uphold, to uphold the laws and constitutions of the United States of America, the laws and constitution of the United States of America, the state of Michigan, the state of Michigan, and the city of Garden City, in the city of Garden City. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. I'll call up Police Chief uh, Tim Gibbons. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Yeah, tonight we are swearing in a police officer as well as a firefighter. Congratulations to our newest firefighter. You've got a great city to work for now. Um, yes, but Ryan Kane is our new uh, officer tonight. He comes to us from the city of Ypsilanti Police Department, um, where he spent three and a half years there. Uh, he's a member of the community policing team, uh, evidence technician, uh, interview interrogation trained, uh, crisis intervention training, active shooter response training, so a whole lot of training we're gonna get the benefit from. Um, and uh, getting an officer with some with time in the job sure doesn't hurt. Uh, uh, Ryan is originally from Marysville. Uh, he attended uh, Macomb County Co Community College for an associate's degree and received his uh, police certification from the academy there. Uh, Ryan has also decided to join us in the midst of his honeymoon. He was just married uh, less than a week ago. What better place to spend <laughs> your honeymoon Thank you. than the city of Garden City, right? Um, and uh, so, and his wife Alexis will be pinning his badge on. Um, but anytime we get a, a person from another city with some experiences and time on the job, I always like to point out that uh, we do so because uh, the citizens uh, provide a great community to work for. Uh, city council provides uh, a great great council to work for, and the employees are great people to work with. And uh, anytime uh, we get a new hire, especially with some time on the job, I, I just like to mention that it's the culture of Garden City that makes us great. And I, I want to thank everyone uh, for uh, creating that. And I'm glad Ryan's joining us. So if uh, you'd be sworn in by the clerk. Chief, are you glad the firefighters showed up for him? <laughs> Su super nice of him. I really appreciate it. <laughs> Repeat after me. I, Ryan King. I, Ryan King. Being duly appointed. Being duly appointed. As a fully empowered police officer. As a fully empowered police officer. You hereby solemnly swear. Do by solemnly swear. That I will uphold and defend. I will uphold and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution and laws of the state of Michigan. The Constitution and laws of the state of Michigan. And the laws and ordinances of the city of Garden City. And the laws and ordinances of the city of will uphold and abide and will uphold and abide by the rules and regulations by the rules and regulations as well as all other orders as well as all other orders be they general specific or otherwise be they general specific or otherwise of the garden city police department of the garden city police department to the best of my ability to the best of my ability that i will not that i will not at any time at any time Lend aid, advise, or succor. Lend aid, advise, or succor to any organization known. To any organization known or suspected. Or suspected 
of having subversive tendencies. Nor will I. Nor will I. In any way. In any way. Affiliate myself. Affiliate myself with such organizations. With such organizations. Okay, we're going to recess to let the police and firemen uh, file out. Go to recess, please. Okay, we're back in session. Uh, moving on to comments from state and county officials. I see that we have Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib here. Do you have any comments for us tonight? Or? No, thank you, Mayor uh, and Council Members. I was just here to uh, congratulate Mr. Schroeder on his uh, promotion, but I understand that he is now a father of new twin girls. So we will wait and come back to the station, uh, but congratulations to his family. And of course, I'm incredibly proud of his long history. I mean, I think at age 21 was hired into Garden City. And so to see someone from our own community uh, being uplifted and promoted is kind of incredibly special. So okay. just wanted to be here to celebrate with his family, but I guess we'll have another celebration tonight. So, okay. but thank you, Mayor, and, and thank you all so much for allowing me. Thank you. And I see we have Mr. Peterson here from uh, Joel Jones' office. Mr. Peter. Uh, I came out to congratulate uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Schroeder on his promotion to an engineer. Also, uh, we missed uh, Fire Marshal John Smith's promotion. Okay. So we brought a, a proclamation out for him as well. Can you give uh, that to the city clerk? We'll make sure he gets it. Okay, great, great. Appreciate That's all you coming I out. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else from the state or county? Okay, we're going to move on to item uh, seven. We have a presentation to the city council tonight uh, by uh, Catherine Kaufman, uh, marijuana attorney. Uh, the way this works, she'll do a presentation. There'll be questions 
asked by the council members. Anyone from the public, you'll be able to make comments uh, under public comments later. Okay? Uh, Good evening. Thank you for having ahead. me. Uh, my name is Catherine Kaufman, and this is my law partner, Robert Thal. We are from Bauckham, Thal, Sieber, Kaufman, and Coaches in Kalamazoo, Michigan. We are a municipal law firm based in Kalamazoo, um, where we represent cities, villages, and townships just like you, just like Garden City. Um, since 2008, we've been involved in municipal regulation of marijuana. Uh, which was the 2008 Primary Caregiver Act, Michigan Medical Marijuana Act, where we've helped both our own municipal clients and also we serve as the general counsel for the Michigan Townships Association. So we have been involved in municipal regulation of marijuana since 2008. I personally have served, uh, I was appointed by Governor Snyder to serve on the Medical Marijuana Advisory Panel representing townships. Um, and as general counsel, which Robert Thal is the lead counsel for the Michigan Townships Association, we have been involved in the legislative process, both for the MMFLA in 2016 and ongoing legislative efforts for marijuana since that time. I've served as a panel member for the uh, MRA, the Ma Marijuana Regulatory Agency, now called the CRA, Cannabis Regulatory Agency, when they produced a guide for local government. So if you ever want to sit and watch that video, you're going to see my face uh, on it talking about marijuana. Um, and we are both active members of the State Bar Association section on marijuana. Um, and I serve as a speaker at their conferences. As recently as three weeks ago, I was on a panel speaking about municipal regulation of marijuana with two in industry attorneys. So we have developed a, a niche practice in municipal regulation of marijuana. We only represent the, mar the municipal side. We will not go over onto the industry side. So um, because we are a municipal law firm, that's where we have kept our focus. Uh, we represent several cities, townships, villages that have authorized medical and adult use marijuana, which is what we technically call recreational adult use marijuana. And because of that, we have developed a different approach than limiting numbers because um, we were so involved in drafting the legislature in the legislative process for the MMFLA, the 2016 Act. And I think everyone understands the 2018 Act was a voter approved initiative, so uh, the legislative process did not allow us to participate in that Act. But in the 2016 Act, we very really carefully worked through the Michigan Townships Association, who worked with the Michigan Municipal League, to make the default position an opt out. It, it was You were not going to get medical marijuana unless you opted in. You affirmatively had to take a step to opt in. That was the position, the line in the sand that the municipal entities uh, took in that legislative process and it worked because if you didn't want anything then you didn't get anything essentially. That default position flipped when we went to the 2018 voter approved initiative which was drafted by the industry essentially, put on the ballot and was passed by a majority in the state of Michigan. So I'm going to let Attorney Thal talk about the approach that we've taken in our firm to allow municipalities to opt in for medical marijuana, to participate in adult use or um, recreational marijuana if they want to without limiting the numbers because I think you are familiar that when you start to limit the numbers and therefore somebody wins and somebody loses, that's the highest level of uh, litigation that's going on in the, in, in the in marijuana field right now. So I'm going to turn it over to Rob Thal and then we're both here to answer questions. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Rob Thal. I'm a senior partner in our law firm. And uh, as Attorney Kaufman indicated, that's pretty much what our firm does. We represent municipalities, over 120 mis municipalities that we represent throughout the state. Uh, so we're very much involved in marijuana regulation in various uh, cities and townships and villages. And so what we found is um, that and I, and I think in your city that you've opted in to medical marijuana. And so we have a lot of communities that have, you know, dipped their toe into medical marijuana and then they're considering what do we do? Do we want to get involved in recreational marijuana? And, um, the, you know, the medical marijuana industry is, uh, is shrinking while the, the recreational is kind of the expanding market. So, it calls into question whether the medical model will remain into the future, you know, or whether they'll just be put out of business moving forward by the recreational industry. Uh, but when you're looking at what, what you want to do, you know, you can do recreational. That's, you've opted out right now. You could opt in. The main reason why municipalities opt into the recreational is uh, what I see as financial, um, because uh, the recreational provisioning centers uh, or establishments uh, um, pay in an excise tax. 
and then that excise tax annually is paid out to the local municipalities based upon the, the number of uh, uh, establishments, retail establishments that you have in your community uh, versus the total number in the state. And so the first year it was 20 something, 28,000. Uh, last year it was over 50,000 per uh, retail or micro business establishment. So substantial sums of money um, uh, can be used to support uh, government functions, you know, whatever you might want that money for, uh, for public benefit, um, certainly. And so, you know, I've got communities where, you know, they're, it, it just depends on the number, but that's the, the main, probably the main reason why you would go recreational because when it was first set up, the medical did allow for, uh, you know, you would receive an excise tax on medical that went away with the recreational and they flipped it over and said, it doesn't matter, you don't get anything. So you have your annual uh, licensing fees, you get that five, up to $5,000 per license that you have for medical, but those fees can only be used for administration and enforcement of your medical or marijuana program. Um, if you, uh, and with the law, the way it's changed now, the excise tax only goes with the recreational. That's why most communities that have medical have switched over to start to do recreational because, you know, they'll get an, that excise tax, which is 50,000, well, it's 50,000 uh, plus for each retail establishment. Uh, you know, that number can change. It could go up, it could go down, but it's a substantial amount of money really per establishment. Uh, to help support your government functions. So that's, uh, that's kind of the reason why then, you know, people might have gotten to medical thinking, okay, we're gonna get that tax money for it. Now you don't get that. So you can go into the recreational side of it, you get the excise tax uh, money annually for that. Again, that can be a substantial amount. And, um, you know, in doing that, uh, uh, those funds can be used for, uh, of any purpose. So while your licensing fees, the $5,000 per license are limited to just administration enforcement, with the recreational amounts, uh, the excise tax, you can use that for anything. So if you wanna use it for parks, you wanna use it for whatever you wanna do, you can use it for those purposes, for law enforcement, whatever it might be. So that's really the main reason why uh, those that went in for medical have switched over to uh, recreational, and plus the the medical field, the medical uh, uh, industry is kind of being overshadowed greatly by the recreational industry. So what we've got into is you have your medical that you have established. Now, if we do recreational, if you start allowing recreational licenses and you do it on a criteria basis or a point system. What we've seen throughout the state are lawsuits. Whenever you have winners and you have losers. So you say we have 10 licenses and you know you get 30 different applicants applying and who may challenge you. And what we're seeing around the state is that most of the criteria based uh, uh, requirements um, when you give them points for are you from you know hometown or you know what are, Case just a number of the different standards. The Detroit case just struck down the residential requirements. So, you know, you used to look at can I favor people from my own municipality? So, as the city of Detroit case just struck down the municipal or the, the residents of you living there and getting a preferred status, residential status. So, it, just what we've seen is uh, where you end up in litigation because the losers don't want to be losers. So they want to force their way in the door. They figure they sue you, you'll give another permit, you know, you'll give another license maybe. So, um, that's led to a lot of litigation. So we've looked at a different process um, to try to keep the municipalities out of litigation uh, by, and, and that the criteria based is based upon the statute that says if you, uh, if you limit the numbers, then you have to have a cri criteria based procedure. And that's where people start to run afoul. So what we do is we'll say it's unlimited. So there's unlimited licenses. Now it scares people to start with, but what we do is then we control it in different manners. So we'll use zoning to control the actual number of facilities. So we'll say, okay, unlimited marijuana establishments. That's kind of scary to say, but what we do then is we limit it through zoning. We'll say it has to be set back 
X distance from homes. You know, we sit and you can look at a whole map of, of the city and you can map out, you know, what are the criteria for where we want to see it located? And you control basically the location of where they can occur. And so that's going to control the number based upon where they can, where they can physically locate in your municipality. But you don't limit a number in your ordinance. Right, but you don't limit a number in your ordinance. So then you get away from the criteria-based strategy, which ends up in litigation, and you just use zoning to control those locations. And, that, and you end up with a limited number, but it's limited through zoning, not through uh, your ordinance on licensing. Um, another way that we've approached it too is to, you know, because you have medical, so you might want to dip your toe in it. We've, we've in some places gone with equivalent licenses. So if you have a medical license, then you can qualify for a recreational license. And so that's also put controls on. So we're not into the uh, uh, criteria-based considerations. We, our consideration is, uh, and our requirement is that you have to have an equivalent license, a medical equivalent license. And so if you have that, then you can qualify for the recreation. Now, we've used that successfully also in, in municipalities to uh, control the number and stay out of litigation in that way too. So those are a couple ways that we do things a little different than the, than the limitation on numbers and the criteria base to try to keep our clients out of lawsuits on it. Because <clears throat> certainly you want to avoid that if you're looking at trying to do it to have some added income to the city, you know, that can go out the window if you're spending it all on attorneys. So. And, and I think I'll just add that, you know, uh, we started out doing this just for our own municipal clients and through our participation in the state bar section, through our participation in some of these um, panels and stuff, we've somehow developed some, a niche where people are calling us now, okay? Attorney Thal has been brought into a couple townships that have uh, had issues with their uh, existing uh, ordinances and we... Uh, Big know, messes, yeah. Uh, here in, in the Kalamazoo area, over here in the and we've had to try and help that municipality strategize as to what, what do they really want to get to and how can we get there legally. And sometimes it, it goes to non-renewing licenses when people don't perform what they're supposed to perform, cut them off. Um, but you know, it, it takes a very um, cogent response from you know the policy direction comes from the legislative body. You let us know, you know how you want to do this and what you want to do if you want to do it at all and then we help figure out the lawful way to execute that. So it's not always just starting from the beginning. Sometimes we come in in the middle and inherit something and we work from, work from there. So we're happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. Okay. Council Member Earl. Uh, first off, thank you for coming tonight. It sounds like you definitely have the qualifications to speak to this. Um, I'm interested in the uh, revenue side of it. Can you explain how it's broken down, what percentages uh, it, it come, you know, through the, the act that comes back to the municipalities. And then also, short of a legislative change, is this something that the governor can just one day say, oh, we're gonna change it and you guys aren't getting it? Or does it take a legislative change to change it? Well, that would take, a, it would take more than just, I mean, it would take a legislative change, but because it's initiated legislation, it takes a super majority to do anything with it. So uh, both the Republicans and Democrats have to get on board with whatever the change would be made. Yeah. So it's, now, it's no easy feat to just say, oh, we're not gonna, we're gonna do away with this uh, excise tax. I think that's a major, and the excise tax is a major part of this legislation. Now they did kind of do the switcheroo between medical, uh, medical to adult. adult use, but now that it's with adult use, I don't see it going anywhere, and again, because it's initiated legislation, it'd be very hard to change that. Um, you know, any kind of change uh, to the detriment of local municipalities certainly would be battled at, you know, uh, yeah. So in September. Okay. All right, sorry. In September, the C Cannabis Regulatory Agency, which is, it's now called that, it was a marijuana regulatory agency until a short while ago. They look at everybody who has an adult use retailer and micro business licensed and operating in their municipality. 
um, and then the following March you will get the money. The first year there was 28,000 per, and there just wasn't that many licensed facilities up and running and selling out into the into the market. Last year it was 56,000 per. So he represents a municipality that has 20 some licenses. They got over 300. And, $50,000 that paid for their police department that year. Okay, so what I think I see a lot of municipalities especially um, think that if we have a lot of licenses, that's going to generate a lot of money, but as Attorney Thal said, the license application and the, and, and the renewal fees are restricted to application, administration, and enforcement. So, you know, we haven't had a challenge yet that we know of in a court as to what those fees can be spent for, but we will look to the plain language of the statute which tells us application, administration, enforcement. So I can't take that money and pave a road, okay? So then, you know, when you start looking at the adult use side of it, you think, well, the only way, if, if my goal is to earn extra income for my municipality, then I need to consider, start to consider, you know, the adult use retailer and or a micro business, which is a combination, and there's two classes of micro business, regular and class A, that has a retail component. And then if I decide that, you know, as, as Attorney Thal said, where would it be appropriate for me to locate that in my municipality such that the land use is um, consistent with everything else in that zoning district, okay? Under the, under the administrative rules, it says um, adult use grow, growers, medical and adult use, are supposed to go in agricultural or industrial zoning districts. So when you have that grow component there, generally, and this is something we could all talk about, but generally we look at it going in, and I'm sure you don't have agriculture like some of the places we represent, but perhaps an industrial district that you would locate those in. Um, if you have a standalone um, retailer, they're just retailer on its own, then it, you, know, you might decide it goes into a, a commercial strip or something like that. Okay, Council Member Squires. Now, I wanna, um, you said that the, if, if we are open to unlimited uh, companies that do this, it can be controlled through zoning, and it can also be controlled if they, we can limit it, if they have a medical license, then they can get yeah, there's a couple. Uh, as I, in, there's a couple different ways that you can do it. One way is through zoning, where you say unlimited, um, and then you don't have criteria based. It's zoning based. You know, you can have overlay zones and put it in certain areas. You could have, you know, we tip, typically will use setbacks um, from various, uh, you know, schools, uh, churches. Uh, municipal parks. boundaries, parks, and other things to kind of rein in what areas will will they be allowed in. And so that, when you do that, we work with the planning department um, to basically develop a map of where can these things be located in your city uh, through reason, and of course your, your zoning has to be reasonable. Um, there's a, you know, that that is a legal requirement, but you know, it's no problem if we look at a map and, you know, we do this and we can figure out what areas of the, the city that you you would like to see it in and then limiting the numbers by limiting those areas. And then the equivalent. Uh, yeah, and then there's also kind of a different way you can approach it is to do equivalent licenses which require them to have, if they have a medical, then they can apply for a recreational. If you don't, then you're out. Okay. Mayor? Thank you. Are you done? I'm done. Thank you. Councilmember Jacobs? Yeah, so we, we have an industrial area that we've, uh, that we have already in the city, and we've allowed the three medical uh, facilities to go in there. Um, so we have those boundaries with the setbacks and all the other footage from, from all the parks and schools and all that. So if we kind of just moved our medical policy over to the recreational side in the industrial area, went unlimited. Um, could we also make them do what we do with the medical, make them uh, grow, process, and dispense? So we don't have standalone little drug stores. We can make, can we make them like we did medical where they have to do all three to be able to dispense? Require co-location, so there wouldn't be a freestanding retailer. Right. Do you, yeah. I, I would think that you could. Yeah. 
We, we, we think, yeah, we've talked about this in the car on the way over here, probably yes, because the, the statute says you can adopt uh, regulations that provide you know, reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions. Location is considered one of those. So yes, you probably could. As um, I think Attorney Thal mentioned, people get, uh, um, are often afraid when you say unlimited because they look to the worst case scenario that you know we're gonna get inundated and overrun with uh, adult use retailers or adult use facilities establishments. So it's, uh, but yes, if it sounds like you've already done a lot of the legwork, you know where you have your medicals, whether you, you know, go through your, and I, we looked at your ordinance, we weren't sure if it was a zoning ordinance or if it was a licensing ordinance or if it was a combination. So, you know, we would wanna make sure that the zoning would be amended and ready to go in place before you revised any licensing ordinance so that, you know, the zoning regulations are there and effective before any licensing comes out because, you know, once you, authorize the new licenses, you need to have your restrictions in place and effective, right? Right, you have to you have to make sure that you're adopting all of your ordinances at the same time so that they're not out of sync with each other. You wouldn't wanna say unlimited and not have your zoning buttoned up and you're gonna get requests all over the place. So you would adopt all your ordinances and ordinance revisions all at the same time. Okay, and then if you, we have the three medical that are approved. Uh, none of them are opened right now. Uh, would they have to be opened before they would, uh, you said they could get the equivalent of, or move over to the recreational, or could we avoid a lawsuit by allowing them, since they have a medical license, to... But they're not open, you say? They're not open yet. How long has it been since you were authorized them? Uh, three years, four years. Yeah, see that's something too, uh, kind of an aside on that point is, you have to build in things into your ordinance to make sure that they are actually, you're giving them these valuable licenses that they actually are following through with it and making use of it. What I found at the beginning is that a lot of people would try to acquire licenses for no other purpose but to try to turn around and sell them for a million dollars a pop, you know, okay. You know, so, uh, you know, and then people weren't paying for it. They were just sitting there with, with their licenses and not really moving forward. So, I mean, that's something in your ordinances that's not addressed. We would want to address that so that they can't just sit there and, and right. hold it and not do, you know, if you've given three licenses, that means you want these three facilities to move forward. Right. And if not, maybe there's provisions to remove them. But, you know, if they're, in one of those, in the one situation where I came in with the equivalent licenses, a lot of them were not open yet. And so we allowed them to proceed on both levels for recreation and medical. But I would definitely get a handle on, like you have one year to. to All right, well to, we've, we've had, we have the one that's probably the closest that's taken over an abandoned building that was 25 years old, blighted, uh, EPA problems. So they put a lot of money into it and it it's taken time the other two uh one hasn't done anything it's just a vacant field um which we've discussed before about putting something in that they have to do something yeah uh, but you know I, I i would think there's some uh mitigating circumstances for a, a company that's taken over a huge building and putting a lot of money into it and making progress just hasn't been able to open yet. Right. What we'll build into the ordinance is a provision that would um, allow the, the city council to extend a license if they're making progress towards uh, opening. If they're not doing anything, you're not gonna renew their license. Right. Uh, if they are, then, so do you annually renew these licenses or how does that? Yeah. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Business license I renewed annually, yes. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, that's a time when you kind of get a handle on them. You know, what are you doing? <laughs> and if you're not doing anything, we're not gonna renew the, the license. Okay, thank you. I got a few questions. Um, you mentioned several municipalities are experiencing lawsuits from uh, different people trying to get a store in different cities. You also mentioned the uh, there's more stores opening up throughout the state every day. That's competition that drives the price of marijuana down, that drops the profit. So that drops the money going to Lansing that they're gonna divvy out to municipalities. When you have more stores open, that competition's gonna drive the price down. 
Yeah, the prices are falling, but they're what, falling. But what, at the conference, I was at the uh, marijuana law conference of the state bar, and I think they indicated that they're having bigger sales than ever this year. Even though the prices are dropping, there's more places open and there more revenue coming in. But yes, it is. You it's know, it, it can fluctuate. Yeah. You know, that amount could be fifty thousand now. It could be back to twenty next year, or it could be higher. But what I've heard is that the the amounts coming in are larger than last year, even though prices okay. are down, but there's more facilities open. And then you mentioned uh, if we went the zoning route, there would be uh, less chance of a lawsuit. Can you guarantee if we went the zoning route, we wouldn't get sued? I can never guarantee anything. There, you can always be sued by anybody. Thank but you. That's we, what I wanted to But we've used this We've process. had lawsuits in this city. That's oh, yeah. one of my big concerns. Even though you say that's the oh. way to go, you can't guarantee us that we still wouldn't get sued. No, I can't. I okay. mean, anybody can sue you over anything, but... And then oh. you mentioned if we offered the medical first, the, the ones that have the medical license, I think that's a possible lawsuit from the other people that say, hey, we, we didn't get a chance. You, you gave it uh, the recreational to them just because they had medical. I could see us getting sued somebody that said that's not fair I didn't have the opportunity yeah I correct mean, that is correct you could okay. I mean there's always there's always the possibility of suit I just yeah. have okay. not in the things that we've done I have not experienced that for my clients um, those issues okay that's all I had yeah. thank you council member Lynch okay I'm I have two basic questions I'm trying to wrap my head around the equivalency license um, because we only have the three, and our in Garden City is under six square miles, so it's a small community. Our industrial section is a small area based on the fact that we have a small community. We limited to three um, medical marijuana, and they're all inclusive. It's the growing, the processing, and the selling. One of them is very close to being open, and the other two are not. That being said, if we did an equivalent license, if we went that direction, would it be because those three already have the medical license, that would be considered an equivalent license? Or would it mean those three plus however many more we can squeeze into the area based on our other ordinances for medical? Well, if you kept medical, so if you kept medical, if you could have more for medical, then it would allow for more. We'd equipment. have to change our medical from three to unlimited. Well, no, because that's what I'm trying because to figure medical out. doesn't have that same criteria. But medical, if we did, I'm and I'm sorry, yeah. but if we did equivalent license, and we didn't want to be sued, would we have to change the three to open unlimited? No. No, you would no. not. No. Okay, so we could the keep three, it. The three would govern, would control, okay? Okay. The equivalent license. So then you see the value of the two that are sitting out there that nobody's done anything with, right? Mm -hmm. Do you see how that would become extremely valuable? Yes. Okay, so, and, and I just, as an aside, um, you know, we looked at um, the, uh, the ordinance and it said something about marijuana operations or remember it said something. We were wondering, does that mean grower licenses or does it mean, you know, at the same location, how many? Because the only thing I'm talking about is a lot of people want to get to excess grows. Excess grows allow you to stack at one location and the way you get an excess grow, which is developed through the administrative rules, not through the statute, is you have to have two medical licenses and then five adult use licenses, and so then people stack, 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 stack. So, you know, we would want to spend a lot of time talking with you if you wanted to move forward on this at all, and that's certainly your right to do whatever you want to do, figuring out exactly what you're looking to get out of this and how we would best accomplish it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And in that same vein, being that we only have one that's close to being open and the other two aren't, if we put something, if we decided to rewrite what we have right now and put in something that says you have to be 50% or you got to be open for six months or something that makes sense, that would be something that council could do in order to then move on to the equivalent license, yes? 
I think we could require that they actually be operating okay. under an equivalent license. I mean, because, yeah. I mean, otherwise like, they could just sit there. They're longer. sitting on a license yeah. that either became very valuable and they're just looking to sell it to the highest bidder right. or, right. And that's what we want to avoid. We right. want, you want to find people who want to that operate are doing local it for business. The right reasons. Yeah, yeah. They want to be part of your community. All right, now I have one other bigger question for you though. Uh, with the president announcing, what, a week ago, a week and a half ago, that he's already pardoning on the federal level people who were put into jail, prison, for just marijuana. And he said that he is working, and I know that's true, that they're working on taking marijuana from being a class one substance down so that it no longer has the federal level of, you know, being something that you could be put in prison for or whatever. How would that, if that goes through, and that, let's say it goes through in March or April, let's say, how would that affect what we're working on? So that, that really isn't gonna have any effect on what our laws are in the state of Michigan. So um, the, the biggest effect it will have is on industry being able to deposit money into, say, a bank and use the banking system uh, if it's taken off the, the schedule. Um, otherwise, you know, we have our own, like any other state, you know, the federal government may decriminalize it or do whatever they do, but it's still gonna be up to each state as to what their laws are gonna be with regard to marijuana. So in Michigan, our laws would remain the same, just we're not gonna have uh, any issues uh, that could arise, you know, uh, with me. I just wanted to add, and. and I, did, I don't wanna to fail to mention, there's a social equity component to the adult use marijuana statute, which is uh, uh, a strong encouragement to um, favor people who have been negatively impacted by prosecution of marijuana previously. So this is part of our state law. So when you talk about the federal law possibly moving in that same direction, we've already got that component introduced here in the state of Michigan. And not that you have to do anything with it in your ordinance, but you, you know, sometimes people look at that when they're developing criteria. Our whole, our whole guide is we're not developing criteria, but I didn't want to miss stating that that's already a component of our state laws here um, and to allow people to enter into the industry maybe who have been negatively impacted in the past. So it's not surprising that the federal government may be following behind um, us in the state of Michigan and it is a, it is a big emphasis under the state, under the adult use statute. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody? Mayor, I have questions. Council Member Care Photos. If we decided to um, do this by limiting um, our ordinances, we already have the space available. We, we said you can only open these things in this certain area. It's, it's a very small area, it's only a couple blocks, and it's very limited with buildings. Is that gonna make a difference if there's only, we say unlimited license, but there's only 11 buildings in that whole area and only two of them are available? Is there? Lo possible lawsuit just because the area well, is so small or? You know, as Attorney Thal said, we can never guarantee there wouldn't be a challenge. We haven't right. had a challenge yet. What it will do is drive uh, real estate prices very high. Yes. Okay, so people who may have decided now they're not going to participate might change their mind otherwise, wouldn't you say? Oh yeah, yeah. And of the 120 cities that you guys represent, how successful have you been? Are, are those so, cities? I don't think we've had any We've Litig had no litigation right. on our zoning standards or equivalent criteria. I mean, there have been lawsuits or various things, but not the, how it was established. So I mean, administratively, yeah. there can be issues, but. So from the Kalamazoo area, we're from Kalamazoo area. I represent the city of Portage, which is 50,000 people. They use this process. The city of Kalamazoo uses the process. Kalamazoo Township uses the process. And I'm not sure how many others. So. Um, it can. Yeah, we did it over in um, Monroe. Monroe Township, yeah. Monroe Charter Township. So, it's it's working. We have not had a legal challenge yet. Of course, we cannot guarantee there would never be a legal challenge. Um, I think what's interesting is the industry side. We were just at the conference a couple weeks ago. The industry itself recommends this approach because they know 
they know if they go into a situation where there's a cap on the numbers, there's a limit on the numbers, that there will be litigation. And they, as well as anyone, time is money to them. They want to get their licenses. They want to get open. So, you know, um, they, we get recommended by people in the industry to come out and basically talk about how we do this. And we can never guarantee there wouldn't be litigation. We just say we have not had it directly on our, in our clients. Okay, and then if, if we say um, you can only get the recreational if you already have the medical, could another group just come and hurry up and apply and buy medical, or is it? Well, you've limited your medical under your ordinance to three, right? So, so they couldn't would do be, that. Unless you tell us to do something different, okay, we would be working with the three. We would be looking at the three. We would see if any of the three are going to fall off for not pursuing through to operations and opening, right? And then obviously if one or two of them fell off, then there's a couple medical licenses that would be the gateway to getting an adult use license. And do you know anything about the cities that you represent, like if their crime rate has gone up or they've had major problems with opening um, multiple sites? So um, I represent the city of Portage. Um, it's 50,000 people. Their crime rate has not gone up. Um, I represent several rural townships along I-94 in the Paw Paw, Michigan area. If you ever drive to, you know, to Chicago, you will pass that area. We have kind of a little green triangle over there where several of the townships around there have uh, allowed adult use and medical marijuana. We recently had a, a crime spree, but it was somebody coming from Chicago along I-94. So it was the proximity of I-94 to, um, and people knew where these facilities were, and actually the, the one, they never got in the one at all, the one that's um, got the most uh, on site, he's got several stack licenses, he's got a retailer, they never got in there because of his own security plans. So as you know from having your medical ordinance, you know, this, your, any, any retailer, any, any medical or adult use establishment or facility has to have a security plan approved by the state of Michigan. And then also we saw that your own police department would review that as well. So we can't guarantee, but we have not seen an increase in crime, especially that I'm aware of. How about any of yours? Well, I, ha I have seen where, you know, the retail establishments have been robbed before, but um, basically their security was not up to snuff. Uh, once they went back in, that we worked with the police department to upgrade their security and security cameras and so forth, no problem. But you know, you, it's something you just have to stay on top of with those facilities that you have to make sure that they have proper security and security plans, and that uh, you know they are willing to work with the police on any any type of issues that might arise. I have another question. Uh, the, the mayor suggested about the falling prices of marijuana. I mean, we have liquor stores that have to sell at state minimum and they still make a profit. So obviously you said the uh, income is still increasing, but they're not losing money just because the price is going down. They're actually making more money because they're selling more, correct? That's my understanding. And also, you know, we will see, um, just as with any, you know, economic situation, People are going to open for business. Some of them will make it, some of them won't, okay? But in a lot of our communities, now we've got a building that's been fixed up, okay? Even if, if somebody goes out after two years, we've got a building that's be, you know, re rehabbed, has been brought up to speed, you know, it looks better, the parking lot's paved. Um, so in some cases, you know, we can't guarantee that everybody's going to make it, essentially, right? Um, but. And another uh, aspect of it is economic development, redevelopment of your community, and getting you know blighted or empty buildings fixed up and, and put into more productive use if possible. Are you seeing that in just about every city that's getting yeah, uh, recreational, I mean, that they're taking older buildings and fixing them up and making it nice? That is, yeah. I, that's the trend? Yeah, definitely that is, and, and something the municipalities try to push uh, <coughs> for that to occur, to fix up old buildings. Um, and then, like, if they do go out of business in the future, at least you have a, a new or improved uh, structure there. Are there anything else that other municipalities are requiring um, these businesses to do? Um, I think so. we see a lot of things in ordinances that we don't write, okay? We see things that we aren't, you know, sure would uh, pass legal muster. Um, you know, um, sometimes, you know, we have to uh, remediate a blighted area or something like that. We're just not sure. So 
when you go through the zoning application, like we're saying here, you have an idea of what area you're talking about. The other thing is, as Attorney Thal mentioned, and I don't think it would really apply here because you've told me you have a small industrial area, but sometimes people will adopt an overlay district to highlight an area that's blighted, like maybe an empty industrial park, okay? All the sewer, water, the utilities are all there, but our sites haven't sold out. So you can target that economic development. You can target it by adopting an overlay district that says this is where you have to go. So we do see that sometimes. And we have used it, and communities have used that to identify certain areas where they want to see redevelopment and growth, and it's been very effective um, it's for certain ours. areas. <laughs> yeah, I've had some where they'll set up a downtown development authority only because they have all these nice new buildings coming in, sure. and they get to capture the increased taxable value in a downtown development authority. So there are some benefits there. So all in all, your 120 cities that you represent have been very successful, and none of them had litigation. Well, Not lie. 120 of them have marijuana. Let's say that for clarity. But I'm saying the ones yeah. that are operating now, yeah. there was no yes, litigation. Yes, but you know, it's it's never a perfect science. As you know, the um, uh, the Michigan Supreme Court didn't make a decision on where can we regulate primary caregivers until 2020, and primary caregivers were around since 2008. So you know, uh, to the mayor's point, like we can't guarantee what the courts are going to hold over the next several years. We read the plain language of the statute. We know from being part of the legislative process on the MMFLA, Attorney Thal knows because he is a general counsel for the Michigan Townships Association what the proposed legislative changes are. So we have a, a pretty good uh, finger on the pulse of what's going on, but we can never tell what a court will say. So we, we couldn't promise that we would, we would know. Um, you know, something that comes out of a circuit court, of course, is governs in that county once it goes up to the Court of Appeals, you know, it's a broader and then Michigan Supreme Court. So, you know, we may see some of this coming through the courts um, in the next few years, but as of today, you know, we have not had any challenges to our particular ordinances or the way we've adopted and applied them. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor. I, I think I was the last one that didn't get to go, yeah. Oh. I just have a, a couple questions about the equivalent licenses. You guys touched base on it a little bit. So we do, as they had stated already, that there are three in place. My question is, is if we were to just take the ones that are currently medical, switch them over to the equivalent so that way they had the recreational, but we're not changing that it's just the three. And as um, Councilmember Member Carafota said, there is just the small number of buildings in this location. So we don't switch it to unlimited, and we just leave it at the three, but we switch it over to the equivalent licenses just for those three. Does that put us at risk for any type of litigation for anybody that has applied for those medical or that applied for the medical licenses in the past with us because we're not changing it, we just want to switch it to the equivalent? So the equivalent means you have both. Correct. Okay, so we would not get rid of the medical. The three would stay there, and they would get the chance to elevate. But elevate. just to those three. So if we right. wanted to leave it to just those three, is that and there's not a lot of space for us to go unlimited, as was previous stated, would that open us up at risk for us saying, well, just the three that have already applied and you've got the medical, we're now going to let you go recreational so you have the equivalent license. Does that open us up for risk or does it show us favoritism since we're automatically giving it to the medical as opposed to opening up at the time for everyone that might have wanted recreational? Yeah, I think, I, I think you're fairly well protected. However, again, I can't guarantee that somebody doesn't challenge it. Um, we would hope that we can do it in a way that wouldn't be challenged. Right. Uh, but no, I think that it's fully supportable to say that we've given these three licenses for medical and we're going to allow those three medical facilities to also do adult and leave it at that. And the only other thing I could see happening is for the two that have not progressed, yeah. do they have the right to transfer their licenses? Do they have right to sell their licenses? See, those two would be the only. Problem. Those are the two that sure. you're going to have to, you know, look at because if they have not progressed, and all of a sudden they see a potential windfall coming, right? Um, then they are going to either want to participate in the windfall mm -hmm. or transfer the license to somebody else who will pay them for the windfall. So, so as yeah. Councilmember Lynch had stated, we could, once they go ahead and actually open, we could state after you're open in business and medical operating for six months, then at that point in time, you can apply for your equivalency licensing, and then they could go ahead and do recreational, and we could put that into play. I think yeah, so. I believe yeah. so, yeah. Yep. Now, you don't get the, so you, you don't get any 
uh, of the excise money until they're actually he gave occupancy. I just want to make sure we're not opened up for risk before. I mean, if, we, if we're using the excise money and we get opened up for risk, even to pay to defend us if something were to go through litigation, I just want to make sure we're covering all bases before we're concerned about, you know, a return on the funds. Yeah. Right. Be can I just ask yeah, before it goes back go to the councilwoman, just the same topic. Um, I'm just I'm a little perplexed on the equivalency. Is that a state <laughs> law? Is there an actual law that says you can limit to the three because those three are there? Or is it just a feeling of that's the angle we well, would go with the court to be case? how the state law was. You had to have okay. a better, for a period of time, you had to have a medical license to get an adult use. Yeah. So that was the, the, the standard for a while. Um, that's changed, okay. but it doesn't, no, it's not, the law doesn't say that uh, yeah, you can, you know, it doesn't set up this procedure. But my guess is that's going to be a conversation we're going to have. We have three. Let's give them the three because we heard tonight that that's probably not an issue. So the question is, is that an issue of that's state law saying you're good? I think that's, that's where you're going right, with it. Absolutely. So. That's what I'm trying to ask. I think, I think what we're saying is it is a way to avoid limiting numbers, but still understanding what your exposure would be, essentially, right? And um, it, we believe there's a legal argument to say this is the standard we have set you know, um, it's uh, it's unlimited, but in order to get it, you must have an equivalent license, and that means I must have medical, and you've limited medical to three. Is that so? There you go. So, you know, the medical would stay essentially as it is. The adult use ordinance would say the only way you get adult use is to have an equivalent. Is Isn't that a little bit of picking winners and losers? Because you guys said putting a cap equals litigation, well, sure. but mean, we're picking and choosing winners and losers. Yeah. Because you, there's no other applicants. I mean, the only ones that you have are the that's my concern. medical. So there are no other applicants. You don't accept applications from anybody else. Because we turned everybody else down. So we said that's it and we maxed them. Right. So again, you know, there's no perfect, you know, you can adopt an ordinance that limits the numbers. Um, the industry, when the, when the 2018 um, voter approved initiative went through, they read that as saying you must have at least one of every type. We read that as saying zero is a number. So I can say two growers, two processors, zero, 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 zero on the rest. So this is how unclear this is. The voter approved initiative has holes the size of a truck that you can, you know, you can drive a truck through. So when we say we will be looking at courts to further define this over the years, we fully anticipate that we will see more case law to provide guidance. So at this point in time, this is our best understanding, right? Well, and also, you know, we would have to make a recommendation to you on what, and knowing the particulars of what you have going. Um, and, you know, then we can make a recommendation to you. And maybe equivalent licenses isn't the recommendation. Maybe it will be to regulate it by zoning and do it in that process. But those are discussions that we'd have to have with you moving forward. It's not just oh, this one or that. I mean, we need to look at the whole circumstances and engage. Is there likelihood of suit from somebody else? And how do we, you know, how do we uh, militate that? You know, how do we reduce that? Uh, just uh, so right off that question that I just asked then. So if we were to just do zoning only and say we did unlimited in that area, if we, as we used a point system, and obviously we want to be able to give it to our, the, the, the one actual building that's the, the business owner that's working through, does that open us up for risk at all if they were automatically, or not automatically, but based off the point system, does that look like any type of favoritism? If it was within the zoning, they're obviously already there. Right, there's no point system in our process. Um, there's no point system. Just... If you meet the zoning criteria, you know, M1 zoning <clears throat> district, so many feet oh, away from a house, you know, whatever, you are allowed, okay? then generally through a special use approval or something like that, okay? So there is no point system, there's no number limits, it's just we, as he said, you work with the planning department, we get a map out, we look at it, if you don't like what the map shows, we tweak our setbacks, we tweak the distance between, you know, that type of thing. So essentially you ultimately get to a certain number that can be there, but you have not adopted a number. And I don't think there, and I think it's totally supportable that if you say you're only going to allow it in a certain area, because the statute clearly says that we can put uh, restrictions, including zoning, including zoning restrictions <coughs> on a license. And since those businesses are already technically in place there, that doesn't open us up for additional risk if we just say unlimited, even though they're already there. 
Yeah, if, if we were to say adult use unlimited in the M1 zoning district and then we amend the zoning ordinance to say special use with all the, the caveats that you already have in yours, 500 feet away from this and whatever, then they would come in, they would apply for a license, they'd have to get their special use approval or, or whatever your zoning approval process is. And then they would, if they met all those standards, they would be allowed to open. We like to use a special use process because you can put reasonable conditions on a special use process. It's another way of um, regulating if they aren't complying with their license, their state license, and if they're in violation with a special use approval, we can hold, generally hold a public hearing and think about revoking their special use approval. If you revoke their special use approval, you can then move to revoke their state license because they're no longer in compliance with all your local regulations. So that's generally how we set it up. Of course, if you, you know, wanted to go further with us, we would spend time talking about all these things. Yeah, and I would just say, you know, on the equivalent use, because you have uh, two medicals that are not seeming to do anything, I might be a little more concerned about going that route because mm -hmm. you might be in a position where you need to revoke those medicals from them if they're not doing anything. And so if you're in that position, you might be better off if you have the zoning okay. approach so that you know we're not getting into a mess maybe with them over <laughs> their right to do uh, move, forward. move forward with uh, adult use. So I mean that just kind of we'd have to look at it in more detail and and give you a recommendation in that regard. And then I just had one more question in reference to policing. Have you heard anything coming down from the state? I've been having a heck of a time getting emails responding to me about how they're trying to enforce this uh, driving under the influence or driving while, while impaired? So we prosecute um, for many of our municipalities. There is no easy 0.8, you know, uh, 0.8 um, blood alcohol. Uh, they can still give the uh, test for intoxication, you know, the, the, the test, the walk, the line, all the other stuff. But yeah, it's, it's not easy at this time. I don't have any more inform newer, newer information. I don't yeah, know I don't if you do. I don't think there's a simple test to it. It's just whether they would give you the test for whether you're impaired, field sobriety, and if they think that you're not, then they're gonna take you and get a warrant for a blood draw. Okay, thanks. All right, thank you. Thank you yeah. for having us, and congratulations on your new firefighter and police officer. That is not easy to do, so I have congratulations on that. I oh, have yes. a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. um, Following up with um, Councilwoman DeMichael, so it's it's no different. You you just said it's a sobriety test, just like for a drunk driver. So except we know with blood, uh, alcohol, we know 0.8 is defined yeah. by law to be under the influence, right? With uh, marijuana, they they have to use different indicators, and it's it's not a clear. Yeah, I think it's going to have to be based upon visual sobriety. Um, you know, or blood draw, and then whatever, THC. the last THC in the blood system, which, you know. It's so different the, from all different people. THC remains in the body differently And it affects people in different, different ways. People, right. They know that alcohol affects people pretty much in a standard way, but. Have any of the cities that you represent have an increased problem with that with? Well, uh, it's just my opinion that yes, since marijuana has become legal for anyone 18 and over, yes, there is there are more people driving. I wouldn't say it's any particular city that has adult use marijuana or not. Um, it just is more prevalent. That's what I mean. We don't have it available here, but we still have those drivers here. Yeah. And any, and any home can grow 12 plants themselves right. under the adult uh, use laws. And then my so. last my last question was, um, you were talking about the equivalent license. Have you guys represented a city like us if we that has done that already, that said you have to have um, medical to get the recreational? Um, I have, yes. Um, probably, they were 13,000 population, so smaller, but. Um, Similar to us, though. Yeah, we've used that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for okay. having us. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you very much for coming. Okay, moving on to number eight, uh, Community Shred Day, uh, Mr. Miller. Yes, good evening, Mr. Mayor and members of the council. I just want to do an announcement for our community shred day. Uh, I wanted to, of course, do the announcement so that you would um, bring your documents to be shredded. But also part of this is a um, home pantry food donation. And I really want to encourage anybody that comes through the line for shredding that they will um, bring something for the home food pantry um, as part of the donation of 
us offering the service, but them also uh, donating that food to the uh, food pantry. Uh, the holidays are coming, the food pantry gets a lot of use, um, and so I want to make sure that we have enough stock there to uh, serve the people that need that. Uh, also, part of our uh, shred day will be the uh, collection of prescription drugs. Also, you can bring that. Uh, the police officers will be there uh, to do that, uh, to collect that. Um, shred day is going to be Saturday, November 5th, from 10 until 1, and it'll be in the parking lot in front of City Hall, I'm sure, with the police station, and you will enter off of uh, Central so that you can have a, a good flow of traffic on that day, too. So, thank you. Thank you. We have no petitions or communications tonight, no public hearings. Item 11, the consent agenda. Mayor. Council Member Lynch. I move for the approval of the consent agenda, item 11A, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Support. Support from Council Member Squires. Any comments from the table? From the general public? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Hearing none, motion passes 7 0. Moving on to our action items. Uh, Need a motion to take the 28 passenger bus off the table. Mayor. Council member Carefotis. Is this the time to ask more questions about that? Yeah, we will when we get to number okay. two. Okay, then I motion to remove it from the table. Okay. Support. Support from council member Lynch. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, now we move on to item two, purchase of the 28 passenger bus. Uh, go to Mr. Doherty first, then you can ask your question. Mr. Doherty. Yep, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I did some background looking into it. The council asked to check into about some grants as well as uh, the question was if Gordon Chevrolet offered a bus to the towers. Uh, the grants that I came across was uh, more federal grants and talking to the bus company themselves. They said you're looking more at the fixed routes. That's uh, uh, smart buses. Uh, as far as uh, grants go, he wasn't aware of just uh, kind of a, we can call it luxury bus grants. Uh, I'm sure there are, but uh, as we know, we've asked for grants for years for our fire trucks who actually give grants for fire trucks. So I'm not sure how many, how long that would take to try to get a bus uh, grant if there is one out there. Uh, Gordon Chevrolet was not aware of any offer to any, giving a bus to anybody. They said they just have never done that. And I assume since the towers don't have a bus, uh, that that transaction probably never took place. The other question was insurance itself. We're looking at $2,100 uh, a year for the bus insurance that uh, the clerk's office went through or, or MMMRA, if I'm not mistaken, to, uh, to make sure we gave them the, the qualifications, what we're looking for. So it's, it's back on the table for the, uh, the council to discuss if you'd like to move forward on the purchase of a city bus. Mayor. Council member, care photos. Yeah, I guess one of my first questions is that we're talking about we're going to be using this bus for the seniors going from the towers to the Radcliffe Center for senior bus trips. Yeah, part of it, yes, but that's not the exclusive, certainly. Right, we yeah. talked about parks and rec and stuff, but it's not handicapped accessible, right? Nope. No, so we're going to get a bus for seniors, but it doesn't take people with handicap. None of the current senior trips are done on a bus that's handicap accessible. All maybe, charter buses, correct. Maybe now's the time for a change. Um, and then the other question I had, um, I noticed in here it said most parks and recreation employees would obtain their passenger bus CDL to be able to drive the bus as needed. Um, I did talk to a Garden City resident, and she actually is the person that does the CDL testing for the mm -hmm. state, and she said that those um, laws have changed in February of this year to where you actually have to take a class, and it costs anywhere from three to $6,000. So were we going to, I don't know, do our parks and I mean, rec people, are they here a long time, or is it... People that are, is there large turnover? So we're going to be paying for a CDL for someone that's going to be gone in six months or? I'm not aware of a three to $6,000 to get a that's CDL license. I was told that's, today uh, for CDL, was, a minimum at 3000 I was told this past week it was 25000 for insurance also. So I'm not sure if that's absolutely accurate, but. Well, like I said, I talked to the person that does okay. the testing. She's the one, uh, local resident. She just actually took the whole course and does it for the state. Okay. Um, and she said, um, because you have to go through an accredited CDL school now. Sure, absolutely. That, yeah. yeah, that just recently changed in February. Yeah. So uh, obviously, I mean, I'm I'm for this, but I just want to know if we did more more research. Um, 
you're, they would have to get a class B CDL with the bus driver mm -hmm. in there. Um, you have to be involved in the federal drug and alcohol certificate program, a testing program. I'm Correct. not sure how much that cost. Have we done research to find out how much the bus is actually going to cost with all these other things with it? They would be. Th this is my third bus and my third community purchasing buses, so I've been through this before. Mm -hmm. And as I said at last meeting, you don't realize what you can do with a bus until you actually have it. So we already know we rent buses for senior trips. We already rent buses for our summer program, but it's limited for the fact of the cost of the bus is added on to the uh, the trips. So the request here is it's there's definitely a cost to run the bus, but you're also able to run more activities, which in turn it's two things. One quality of life and it's also bringing in more money uh, to run the trip. So uh, cost itself, we used to rent out in, uh, in my other places, could be a couple dollars a mile depending on what the overall costs are today with gasoline, probably a little more than that if you have an outside group that's interested. Uh, not all staff would get CDL. That's you know, what was obviously. my question. Are we going yes. to do two no. people or we're going to do three people and, and with our Parks and Rec staff, are these people that are long-term employees or well, who's ever interested, usually. Uh, obviously, some people may not be interested whatsoever, but it saves us on the actual cost themselves. They would go on the trip to wherever they're going. Uh, we're going to pay somebody to go on these trips usually anyway, but if they're able to drive, there's a reduction in, in cost overall. So uh, there's always going to be a cost to, to run the bus itself. But going back to the, the uh, I asked the, the bus company itself in reference to the handicaps bu uh, buses. He said, you're looking at cutting out eight to 10 seats out of the bus, and he said, you're also looking at uh, the machine itself rattles and that's one of his things he said this is designed for local bus travel when you're looking at putting making it fully handicap accessible he said that's good for nursing homes and for assisted living homes but he said if this is a travel bus he said we've never sold a travel bus as a handicap accessible bus he said you're looking at two totally different things and this we're looking at as a travel bus so going back to that point of a uh, handicap accessible so I guess I'm just concerned then that we're going to use it for seniors and it's not handicap accessible. Did we talk to that company about used buses at all? No, did not. I know I, that, I would um, hesitate on purchasing a used bus the next 20 years, I guess. So I, I was Googling today and I saw that company come up, that Tesco, mm -hmm. and um, they actually have um, a bus on their website that is just a 2021 with 30,000 miles that actually has um, handicap accessible and uh, it says that if they're not being used for that, like if you're not, don't have anybody with a wheelchair, it actually adds more seating. So it's a 20 passenger bus um, without the uh, someone in a wheelchair and it's an 18 passenger bus with a wheelchair. And that we're looking at a 28 passenger bus. So you're looking at eight to 10 chairs for every single trip we go on that you just lost for the ability to go out west to uh, Grand Rapids, the Frederick Meyer Garden every day for summer camp that may be running around. You lose eight seats on a bus, you know, council, it's going to be pretty significant cost over time. So then this isn't focused on the seniors. This is just about. No, this travel. is, I and mentioned last meeting that once you have the bus, we'd be able to say a Tuesday morning, run over to the tower, pick up people up and go over. We have the Nankin system that we also have here. Yeah. And uh, you know, council, Councilwoman Lynch and I were talking about that a little bit as far as Nankin, of if that's something that some of our senior funding goes towards is helping if they're coming going on a trip either or local going over to Radcliffe somebody clearly needs a, a fully uh, disability bus they can actually be paid for through our senior program if we're interested in, in going that direction but nobody should look at this bus as saying this is a senior bus to run senior trips exclusively by no means absolutely this is as I mentioned last meeting council going on a blight ride with the press included or public that like to go you can use that uh, that trip as a as a bus trip for the council, so it's not exclusively for seniors. Okay, and does our liability change then because it's for rent? No, we would still drive it. You know, we're not giving the bus out to somebody right. else. But the no. state, the state qualifies it as either it's for hire or it's not. Yeah. So it says as a municipality, we use it for our, you know, parks and rec and and mm -hmm. us getting on it. But if you hire it out. It changes for the... We'd have to look into that. I'm not sure at this point, but that's not a focus of ours by any means. That's a possibility. We had my other places, there were church groups that wanted to go look at Christmas lights. So they came and rented our bus, we drove around to Christmas lights. Uh, simple things as the mayor, I know he's talking about, he rents uh, the bus for our Christmas lights here. That might be something that groups want to do. So we would not necessarily be taking groups across state lines if we no, did something just, local. I'm just talking about the state of Michigan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's either a bus for hire or not a bus for hire. That's yeah. it's yeah, that would not be a focus of this bus by okay. any means. That's all my questions. Mm -hmm. Councilmember Lynch. I just wanted to throw in real quick on the CDL. I happen to know from my previous school, we had our own bus, 
and there were three different bus drivers that had their CDL that practice bus driving and do that for the public schools. And they were available at certain times. So if we went on a field trip, whether it was during the day or in the evening, they mm -hmm. were able, one of them was always able to drive the bus, already had the CDL, already had um, yeah. the other certification. And they didn't charge a lot of money to us to do that. So that's always another possibility. Yes, it doesn't have to be an absolute department employee, but if you go that direction, if there are some local bus drivers, they could actually come through as part-timers for the city as an employee, but only used as needed in that situation. So we would not just call upon some outside driver to take our bus and go. Yeah, correct. Okay, motions in order. Mayor. Councilmember Lynch. I move to approve a contract with Tesco Bus of Oregon, Ohio, in the amount of $139,853 for the purchase of a 28 passenger shuttle bus. Support. Support from Councilmember Squires. Any further comments from the table? Mayor. Councilmember. I just, Jesus. yeah, I have, I'd like the idea of buying the bus. Um, I think we can expand the, the children the kids programs, uh, some trips, uh, senior trips, all that. I think that's great. Uh, but I am concerned with the, the drivers, the CDL. I'd like to have an answer on what it would cost to get that license. If, if it's not the three to 6,000 that uh, Councilwoman Carafota said, then I'm all for it. But if it is three to 6,000, then I'm not for it. And I don't think we should buy it if we don't know that answer. I was just Council, I was just texted by one of our employees downstairs who actually has CDL, be licensed full-time employee downstairs. So. We have one already. Yes. Okay. We have one driver, have but how much driver. does it cost to do the other the other ones? I guess is my question. I'm sure if we it, have lots of people in DB, DPS that are CDL. It doesn't mean they're going to be driving the kids' camping bus. But it doesn't mean they're not. So. Right, but if. But we're going by what was brought to us. If, if it's going to cost, the Rex employees would obtain the passenger bus CDL. All right, if it's going to be three to six thousand each, I don't think that's a wise investment. If it's the twenty-five or a hundred dollars, then I, I'm, I'm for it. But until I know that, I don't. I don't want to approve this and then have to pay all the training. As always, the council would be uh, available to approve this contingent upon coming back with that information in general. We don't have to go and order this tomorrow. Um, but th this is news to me. I'm not aware of this situation, so. Can we table it until there's more information? No. No, we already have the motion on the floor for purchase. Like uh, the city manager said. I'd like to add that into my motion, contingent upon the final information right. from the city manager and approval from the council. For CDLs? Yeah, for the CDL. Regarding the CDLs. Mrs. Squires, would you second that? Yeah, I second okay. that. Okay. Any other comments from the table? From the general public? A question. Can you make your own motion? Yes. Okay. Come on up to the... Speak. Okay. Yeah, ma'am. Um, Lauren Anthony, I just want to say I, I love the idea of a bus and I, I understand where you guys are coming from when you say, well, if we do, you know, one that's handicap accessible, then we lose eight seats. I understand that. But at the end of the day, our, our citizens, we still have people with physical handicaps and sometimes you have kids with physical handicaps. Sometimes somebody walks wrong and they break their foot. And now it just seems like we've you know, you're creating a bus that's a fantastic idea and it's taking people on these field trips or kids or groups of adults and you're just completely cutting out a portion of that by not having it handicap accessible. And I feel like we got, it, the focus was so heavily on seniors being driven around in day-to-day -day stuff that that just kind of got lost. So I just wanted to bring it up just in case it wasn't something that people had had thought of. Um, it's I, I, I don't know what the right or wrong answer is necessarily. I just wanted to make sure that that was something that was brought up. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. And I will be out of the way very quickly. Sorry. Anybody else? Yes. <laughs> That's right. 
that's right. Hi, Jackie Perador, I live on Belton. I just wonder, instead of purchasing a bus, is has anybody looked into the possibility of maybe having a limo service bus contract, an annual contract where that bus belongs to them, is driven by them, the liability is on them, the maintenance and storage is on them, but they are available to Garden City 24 seven. It seems to me like that might be an option instead of purchasing a $140,000 bus, having to train CDL drivers. And I was under the impression from someone I talked to that a lot of the insurance company now, companies now, you have to have a CDL license for so long before you can be a bus driver rented out. I was confused by that, that nobody brought that up. I, I did see that also in the, in the Michigan so uh, website. I, I just talked to somebody I know that's in the business because I don't know that this is something that we need to store, maintenance, insurance, drivers. Is it possible to look into having an annual contract with a company? They would purchase the bus for Garden City's use and then we would pay them whatever, hourly, yearly, whatever. So that's, that's a thought from, from just me because it seems to me like this is a big expense, a lot of labor intensive things that we might not be able to factor into this right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. Hunt. Here we go. As far as the question on the CDL, Anybody that goes through the process, takes the time to get that CDL, is going to keep that CDL. Like Ms. Lynch said, you can, um, through the school she was working at, they had the ability to find people. We have the schools here, I know it's subcontracted out now, but if you put the call out to them, every one of these schools has got uh, sports programs run in the afternoons, evenings, on the weekends. Those bus drivers are out there with both hands up waving. I'll take it, I'll take it. They want the extra hours. If you put the call out in this city, I'll bet you, you got 50 licenses out there at least. When somebody gets a hold of that CDL, they don't let it go. They keep it up to date because if they let it go, they've got to go back, go through all the training, all the processes again. So they're going to keep it as long as they can. So you put the call out, you'll have phone ringing off the hook with people available. Thank you. Mayor? Councilmember Jacob. Have, having said all that, do all those 50 people have uh, background checks and everything that all our city people? Yes. Well, the, the, the school bus is due, yeah. but if we get a uh, limo driver or a limo company, they're not going to have a background check. So we're counting on the school system to provide us our, uh, it's council, our, it's our background check for kids and yeah. all their. Our, our hope and expectation is that they would be city employees. I had a CDL and actually just reminded me when I left the state, uh, I had a change and lost my CDL and that was one of those, oh, I was trying to transfer it to my next state. They said, nope. Mm -hmm. So kind of a similar concept of once you have it, you don't want to lose it. So I drove the bus on a regular basis uh, myself. So we would look to try to keep it in-house. We would not just look for any stranger to come in and drive a bus. Mayor. On that same comment, said that about we have all these bus drivers in Garden City. Garden City is short with bus drivers. My kids' bus is late all the time because we don't have enough drivers. So, I mean, there's lots of people out there with CDLs, and I th think um, that they all have to have the background check in order yes. to get that um, CDL. So it doesn't matter who we get, they all would have the background check. Mr. Witt. Uh, Zachary Witt, Box Street. I just have a quick question, because we were talking about different lawsuits. Does the non-ADA compliance of this bus open us to a potential lawsuit if we don't offer the services? Does anybody know that answer? Because that might be something to look into. Is question and answer period here. Um, yeah. No, I don't believe that we would be liable for having a travel bus that's designed for a travel bus. So somebody with a fold-up wheelchair certainly can still get into the bus if they can get into the bus. It's but not exclusive of just people that have no access. But I've never heard in my entire life anywhere, because you bought a bus that's not ADA, you can't, you're illegal or... It no, might be something to look into just to be safe too, to negate a potential lawsuit if something were to happen. Thank you. 
Council Member Lake. Real quick, just a reminder, Nankin Transit has the handicap accessible buses. So whether it's kids or whether it's an adult for local within the Nankin Transit area, if we have the case that we need somebody, we can get Nankin Transit. Yeah, but they're not going to okay. they're not going to send a bus. You made your comment. Okay, I, I, I can make I can I make another comment, please? Quickly. So I know the senior trip usually does a Mackinac trip. That's not a local that a Nankin bus would be able to handle. I've seen it before advertised through the city channel. Oh, you mean for the seniors? The seniors, yes. The seniors of our city usually, you know, most of the, the tower residents, if available, take that trip to Mackinac. I went to Grand Rapids and they didn't have a handicapped accessible bus and I went with the seniors also. So they don't typically use a handicapped accessible bus from the trips that I've gone on. But if we can make it accessible to the handicapped people, they might also go. That's my, my concern with the seniors in our city. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir, come up to the podium, please. State your name. Again, this is comment time. It's not question and answers. We, you're going against the rule. You make a comment or a statement. Thank you. Uh, Jeff Hodges, I heard earlier that we are really concerned with liability insurance with the buildings and stuff, and I get that. So the $2,100 for insurance a year for this bus, how much liability insurance does that cover us for in the city for anything beyond? I know my car insurance covers me for $300,000. When my kid had an accident, the lawsuit was for 500,000. I had to cover 200,000 of it. So if we thought about how much liability we walk into with accidents. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, roll call. You wanna take roll call on this? Uh, I think there's Mr. one Miller? more. Oh, yes ma'am. Cheryl Presley, Helen Street. Um, on the subject of the marijuana no, no. and this is only on the bus, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Roll call on the vote, please. The motion was by Councilmember Lynch, uh, supported by uh, Councilmember Squires. Uh, this was a motion to purchase 28 passenger bus with the contingent uh, upon the CDL information being provided. <coughs> the first to vote is Councilmember Lynch. Aye. Second to vote is Councilmember Squire. Aye. Councilmember Karafotis. No. Councilmember Jacobs. No. Councilmember Earl. Aye. Councilmember DeMichael. Aye. Mayor Walker. Aye. It was a 5 2 vote. Motion passes 5 2. Okay, moving on to item three, special assessment 2022 sidewalk program. This is just a call for a public hearing on November 28th at 7 p.m. Mayor. Council Member Lynch. I move to approve the attached resolution receiving the special assessment role for the 2022 sidewalk program and call for a public hearing on Monday, November 28th. 2022 at 7 p.m. Support. Support from Council Member Karafotis. Uh, any comments from the table? From the general public? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes 7-0. Uh, DPS Director, Mr. Oman, you're up here for the next three items. First one is HVAC rooftop air handling units. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, this is uh, for the replacement of two HVAC rooftop units at the Radcliffe Center. These units will service the gym. We did receive four bids for this project. Tech Mechanical was the lowest responsible bidder. Tech Mechanical is also our HVAC service contractor. As we were purchasing the Radcliffe Center, Schoolcraft College did mention that there were issues with the AC in various parts of the building. We had Tech Mechanical do a full building assessment. Going through Tech Mechanical <laughs> did make some repairs to some of the units. Some were quick fixes, some were more involved. They also replaced two small units in the Head Start area. Uh, Tech Mechanical recommended a full replacement for these two units that service the gym. Okay. Mm -hmm. Motion's in order. Mayor. 
Council Member DeMichael. I move to approve the contract to remove and replace two HVAC rooftop air handling units at the Radcliffe Center with Tech Mechanical of Pontiac, Michigan, an amount not to exceed $66,312. Support. Support. Council Member Squires. Comments from the table? From the general public? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes 7 0. Next item, scissor lift purchase. Mr. Ullman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is a purchase of scissor lift. Uh, we did put this out for bid, but received zero bids. So I contacted some vendors and received three written quotes. The lowest quote is from Bell Forklift to Clinton Township. Uh, the city's never owned a scissor lift, but I feel this would be a great piece of equipment to perform work at all our city buildings inside and out. Much safer and quicker than working off ladders. Also in the past, uh, for setting up special events, Parks and Rec would have to rent one of these for a week or so uh, for the ice show, figure skating competition. Right now the rental fee is $150 a day, so I feel this would be a smart purchase moving forward. I can't believe as a city we don't own one scissor lift. I mean, that's, that's crazy. I mean, I worked at Ford Motor Company, they're everywhere. <laughs> and they, they're of good use and a safe use. Um, any comments from the table? I need a motion. I need a motion. motion. Mayor. Council Member uh, Jacobs. I move to approve the purchase of a Genie Model GS2632 scissor lift from Bell Forklift of Clinton Township, Michigan in an amount not to exceed $21,839.08. Support. Support from Council Member Lynch. Any further comments from the table? General Public. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes 7-0. Last item, sewer camera purchase. Mr. Oman. Yes, Mayor. Uh, this is to approve the purchase of a sewer inspection camera. This is a budgeted item. Uh, a sewer camera is a very valuable and needed tool for our department. Uh, we have to be able to see what's going on underground. We use a camera to inspect both our sanitary and our storm sewers and also to assist residents that have sewer problems uh, to see what we can see, what's going on with their sewer from the main. Uh, the camera we have now is over 20 years old and has reached the end of its service life. We would be purchasing this camera through a source well contract from the Jack Duhaney Company. Sourcewell is a national cooperative purchasing program for all governmental en entities with over, with over 50,000 members, which we are one of them. The Jack Duhaney Company is the leading provider of sewer cleaning equipment in all of North America, and their headquarters is located in Northville. We have purchased all of our sewer cleaning equipment from Duhaney's for decades and they've always provided us with great support and service. Okay. Motions in order. Mayor. Council Member Lynch. I move to approve the purchase of a sewer inspection camera from the Jack Doheny Company of Northville, Michigan in an amount not to exceed $119,268.26. Support. Support from Council Member Squires. Any comments from the table? Well, it's something that we really need to have. Yep. I know General that. public. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes 7 0. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Roman. We have no other business tonight. Uh, moving on to public comments. If you wish to come to the podium, uh, this is your chance to make a comment or a statement. It's not to go back and forth with questions and answers. And there is a three minute time limit. Yes, sir. Good evening. My name is Doug Stewart. I've uh, addressed before for 32330 Ford Road on uh, marijuana ordinance and you're adopting a, uh, a recreational ordinance and, and licensing. I uh, come to you, uh, retired from the Oakland High Sheriff's Department, a commander with narcotics and uh, formerly with DEA down in Detroit. For the last three and a half years, I've been doing licensing and compliance with the facilities in Michigan. I represent 48 different licenses and I don't know, 16 different uh, facilities, both medical and adult use. So I bring to you information 
uh, is comparison. Our medical dispensaries, remember, you can be 18, 19, and 20 years old and get a medical card. So the ones that are just medical, 90%, 80 to 90% are all the customers are 18, 19, and 20 years, okay? In order to get into an adult use license, you have to be 21. So if you're making an adult use license, the 18, 19, and 20 year olds, yes, your high school seniors, cannot go into that facility because it's an adult use facility. So that oversees or supersedes their medical card, okay, because there's an age limit. You have to be 21 or older to get into an adult use facility. So you're inviting, by opening up just a medical facility, 18, 19, and 20 year olds. That's what you're going to see going in there, 80 to 90%, I guarantee it. We've seen it everywhere. So all the ones that we had that were medical are now all adult use. They can still go in with their medical cards, but you have to be 21 or older to go in there. The 18, 19 year olds can't go to there. They have to go to another one that does not have adult use. So please be aware of that when you're voting and you're considering these things, that you're really keeping it medical. You're taking it to the 18, 19, and 20 year olds. They cannot go into an adult facility. Okay, so please pay attention to that. And as far as consuming, you cannot consume at any of these facilities. So the, driving around, that they can consume or they can grow at a home or buy it from off the street or anywhere. But you can't go in there and consume the product and then drive away and get pulled over. So that's really not a main concern. Um, and the facilities, we have had, yes, we have had theft just like any other retail business. Uh, and we prosecute 100% you know, which deters a lot of it. Uh, and every, same thing with our cultivation and our growing and our processing. Um, it's, it's cameras everywhere. And, and just like I tell all the neighborhood communities, the safest place for a bus stop is at a dispensary or a medical facility or an adult use facility because all the camera systems, we can pull it back and see what's going on with the kids at the bus stop. It's that good. Okay, so please consider that when you're thinking about medical and adult use, you're opening a door for 18, 19, and 20 year olds if it's medical only. And that's what you're gonna have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Cheryl Presley, 5906 Helen Street. And so regarding the marijuana issue, I just wanted to share that the Michigan Marijuana Regulatory Agency projects that there will be $2 billion, that's a B, uh, in sales for 2022, up from $1.3 billion in 2021. So marijuana is here to stay. There's a lot of responsible marijuana users, gummy users, uh, I would prefer to purchase in the city that I live in and see my city benefit from those sales. I can go elsewhere, but I'd rather do it in the city that I love that can benefit from the revenue. Thank you. Anybody else? Hi, Mayor, Council people. I'm Kathy Rifkin. I've been up here before. I'm one of the owners of the property, uh, the cannabis business that's really close to opening. Our only setback now is uh, a DTE because we had a transformer waiting for us if we paid in full, and when we asked for it to be delivered, it disappeared somehow. So we've been pushed back to November, otherwise we are so close to opening and we're excited. But we do have a problem because without the rec, it's gonna be hard for us to sustain staying opened. There is a very large cannabis company that's opened in Southfield, medical only, there's one of them, but they are throughout the country. They are averaging 30 to $35,000 in losses every month because they are not rec. We can't do that. So we are really hoping that the city will change its mind because it would help us out too. We've now put in over $8 million into our building and I hope you have all seen it, but it is turning out to be beautiful and we've gotten great feedback and we'd love everyone to go through. So that's what I'm saying there. And our security, we've already had our neighbors also contact us and ask us for help 
because our system is going to be state of the art and I know the police were excited about it because we're going to be tied right into them. So if there's something going on in the city, we have night vision, we can recognize license plates, we can pull up facial recognition, and hopefully we can work with the city on all that too. So we're really looking forward to being a part of the city and for your support. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Moeller, you want to come up? <coughs> I'm not here about the American marijuana, one way or the other. The city is small, it's six square mile. You're not gonna get a ton of revenue. I don't care what anybody tells you. But I am here to say this. City manager, council, all you people on the council. I've watched people come up here and attack you and attack you and attack you over this, over that. The fact is, we have no state representative. We have no county representative. We have no federal representatives. You people have had to do all this on your own. And you've done a Heck of a job, I think. You kept the city afloat. I remember what I told you when you come here. It wouldn't take long. It took a little longer than I thought they would, but I knew they was gonna attack you. It happens every time. Everybody wants everything their way, including me, but I won't attack you if I don't get it. I'll disagree with you, but I'm not gonna attack you about it. But that, that's getting ridiculous. The library done it to herself. They can blame the city manager all they want to, but it's nobody's fault but theirs. At two or three years in on the operational budget, they decided to siphon money off for a building fund, which they didn't even have, wasn't even on the radar at that time, but they siphoned it off anyway. Then they complained about not having no money for the kids, $4,000, and they were sticking $50,000 in the bank. So that's all their fault. They didn't pay their rent. I still say you ought to evict them. I don't care what anybody says. If I, if I was in an apartment, I didn't pay my rent like they have, I'd be kicked out. They, they're no better than I am. And like I said, I'm getting sick and tired of people coming up here and attacking the city manager and you people on the council who have done a great job considering the fact that you've had no help except for yourself. No county, state, or federal. And you see what happens when the federal shows up late, as usual. She's late for everything. Uh, and she's, I guess we're stuck with her for the next election too, I'm not sure. I thought sure she went somewhere else. But now I'm hearing we got her again. Well, uh, that's just breaks, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Ms. Dole? Kim Dole. I've got a couple of things. Uh, first, Goodfellows is having a fundraiser on Sunday, November 6th at Oak Lanes. And uh, I believe the tickets are $20, gives you a couple games of bowling, your shoes, pizza, we have a lot of raffles. So um, you can see either myself or Denise Stabley for tickets and we'll set you up with that. Um, the second thing, I just completely forgot what it was. Oh. <laughs> um, but la oh, lastly, I, want, I wanted to um, send condolences out to uh, Kathy Cohen. She is a past DDA trustee. She lost her mother recently, and uh, she's, had, she's had a hard way to go in the last year or so, so I just wanted to make sure that we sent condolences out to her. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? City Manager's report. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just two things. Positive note, uh, Halloween egg haunt on Saturday night was actually much larger than it was the first year, uh, which was an outstanding event the first year. So already, uh, you know, talking to staff, they did a wonderful job, Parks and Recreation out there, people from the ice rink, working with people from Radcliffe Center uh, to put it on. Uh, there's going to be a lot more uh, happenings next year in the uh, 2.0 Halloween egg haunt, so turning that into more of a Halloween event rather than uh, a festival, rather than just the egg haunt itself. So that's looking great for going into next year as well. Some other things by Parks and Rec. Uh, Night of the Tree Lighting is November 28th. This is something just uh, we can come back to you, is the night, night for the uh, managerial audit uh, at the same time. So that may be something we gotta bring back to you, uh, maybe uh, away from the table, because we have some issues going up in, uh, into the next the uh, next uh, <coughs> meeting itself will be right after the election, so there won't be a lot of uh, business done at that point, but that's something, I don't know if you just want to kind of just discuss now. Uh, we should pick a different day. Cause just we need push to, it to the we next to week. To the tree lighting. City clerk, I don't know if it matters the next meeting after that, if the possibility of just 
pushing it just to make sure we can get it on the docket. And that would be meeting at 5.30 early before the regular council meeting, so it'll be the same night. So that'd be the first, that'd be the first meeting in December? December 5th. Okay, is everybody okay with that? We're moving the whole meeting, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah, just so we don't avoid it. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. So the tree lighting's good. Okay. And that, that's all I have tonight. Thank so you, Mayor. So let's make that managerial audit meeting on December tree lighting, say, 5th or 6th? 5th. 5th. 5.36, is it? 5th. The tree lighting? Yeah. <laughs> okay. You all set? That's it, Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Miller. Uh, yes, I uh, just wanted to correct the Goodfellow bowling tickets are 25, not 20. <laughs> that was the note I was given. So. It went up $5 in two minutes? Yes. Wait another few, it'll be 10. So, uh, and it's all going to a good cause anyways. So. <laughs> okay. So, uh, but I did want to uh, uh, also remind everyone that uh, two weeks from tomorrow is election day to exercise their right. If they do have their absentee ballot out, I encourage you to return it as soon as possible so that that will assist in the receiving the results in a timely fashion on election day. Uh, the process is that uh, once we receive the ballot, we scan it in so that you know that we have it. You can find that on the Michigan Voter Information Center. Um, and then we get it ready for processing so that we have the ballots in place um, ready for the absent voter board to start counting on election day. Uh, so far, we're at about 42% of the ballots back already. I would like to see it increase, obviously, right through Election Day. Um, what I'm afraid is that people will hold off to the last minute, and then, of course, then we can't prepare the absent voter board to start counting, and it will delay the results in the evening. So um, if you have your ballot, get it to us as soon as possible, and we'll get it ready for processing. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Jacobs. Uh, not too much, just uh, remember to get out and vote on November 8th, and that's it. Thank you. Council Member Kara Fotis. I just have one thing. Um, since I'm new to council, um, I just found out about SEMCOG. Remember that, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to ask how often that we utilize their services. I'm the one that's always asking about uh, are we getting grants, and I saw that SEMCOG actually has a grant, a grant writing workshop, and I just wondered if any of our employees ever utilize that. Do we have um, someone like in our fire department or our police department or someone on the administration that takes those workshops, they're part of our membership, so. Yes, Councilwoman, we have used them in the past for some, uh, some roadway uh, analysis for accidents and, and some other things, but I will look into that and certainly send somebody over. That's all I have. Okay, Councilmember Lynch. Yes, um, first of all, we had to take someone off our agenda today because firefighter Nicholas Schroeder, who was being promoted to engineer, he and his wife had twin girls over the weekend. And so congratulations to them on the birth of Hannah Grace and Elizabeth Louise. Um, I was asked a question having to do with Meals on Wheels. Someone saw a social media post and asked me how do you do the congregate lunches? And I found out that the congregate lunches are available on site by calling the manager. There's a new manager there, her name is Deb, at 734-394-7803. And I can repeat that again, 734-394-7803. Congregate lunches are the ones where they go in person. So they are available. Um, it's never been a huge draw in Garden City. I think when it was the biggest, there might have been as many as 15 to 20, depending on the day. But um, it's a suggested price of $3 per <coughs> meal. And also, Wayne County is asking for volunteers for the Meals on Wheels program. They're in desperate need all over the area. And if you're interested, there's an application online, waynecounty.com forward slash S V S and you can apply right there and I believe that they pay mileage uh, as a reimbursement for the gasoline. Uh, great witches tea by the Garden City Historical Museum last Friday. I was in attendance and it was just fabulous. They did a great job this year on it. And congratulations to Brenda Rupp 
a Garden City teacher uh, over at Tipton. She was chosen as the best dressed witch. And if you look at their post, you will agree that she looked outstanding. The Egg Haunt and the Thriller Dance by the girls of the Dance Express was a lot of fun. Um, there were over a thousand kids there at this particular egg hunt. It really did grow. And the reason I found out is because they were giving out the glow sticks and they went through almost a thousand of them and other kids brought their own glow sticks and glow ones and whatnot. So that was, they had a hauntingly good time, if I can say that. And uh, last but not least, be sure to drive by some of the outstanding Halloween displays around Garden City. There are some fabulous ones. I, I took my grandson driving the other night, and there's some really good ones. And don't forget this Thursday, the GCBA <coughs> Trunk or Treat is also happening. I don't know if there's tickets still available. Yes, there are tickets still available online. Go to the Garden City Business Alliance website and purchase your ticket for a dollar a piece. And uh, we'll see you there. And happy Halloween to all. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Squires. Um, yeah. uh, I would like to uh, send out my condolences to Kathy Cowan, the owner of Joe D's, and the loss of her mother. Um, also, congratulations to Firefighter Abraham and Police Officer Kane, um, and to the Schroeder family on the birth of their babies. And that's all I have. Okay. Thank you. Council Member DeMichaels. Yep, I also wanted to say uh, welcome to our newest firefighter, uh, Mr. Abraham, and police officer, Mr. Kane. Uh, looking forward to seeing you guys on the force. And then I just wanted to know if we could get an update as to what I requested the last council meeting with the research on um, who knew what and when with the city council in reference to that department. I have nothing for tonight, just still working on it. Okay. Putting the pieces together. Thank you. Thank you. Do any idea when that's going to come about? Uh, maybe in the next week or two. Thank you. You done? That's it. Council Member Earl. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, congratulations uh, to Firefighter Abraham and Police Officer Kane. Please be safe. Thank you for serving our communities. Um, you picked a great city. You both have great leaders and uh, really good partners to learn from. So I hope you have long standing careers here. Um, and for the council, I've heard three or four times now when this marijuana question comes up about uh, enforcement. I can tell you as a 30 year veteran in law enforcement that even back in the 90s, I was trained how to investigate and apprehend individuals who were driving under the influence of a controlled substance. Uh, if you think about it, cocaine, heroin, barbiturates, all of that, you can't blow into a breathalyzer and get a number and you can still arrest them. I have arrested them, I've had them prosecuted. It's, it's possible. Um, our law enforcement are trained in it and I'm sure they're trained a lot better than I was back in 90 whatever. So, um, so uh, you know, I, I'm thankful that we had the attorneys come tonight. Um, you know, it's good to get individuals that have really good, I mean, if, if they're sitting on the committees, if they're involved in the legislation, they do have a, a, a pretty good understanding of it. I'm sure we're gonna have more debate. Um, so I would just ask everybody to really look into it. If you have questions, ask it, and um, we'll talk it through. And that's all I have, thank you. Thank you. I too want my condolences to Miss uh, Kathy Cohen on the loss of her mother. Uh, congratulations, too, to the new firefighter, new police officer, and uh, Mr. Schroeder with the new twins. Uh, your life's going to change. <laughs> to the better, though. Uh, the Halloween egg haunt was fantastic. Uh, kudos to the Dance Express, who did their thriller dance. Uh, they need to be commended. They did an awesome job. Uh, this is our last meeting before the election. Please exercise your right and vote. And then a couple days after the election, we're having a Veterans Day ceremony at O'Leary Auditorium on November 11th at 11 a.m. in the O'Leary Auditorium. There's not another meeting before that. So please come out and support the veterans on November 11th. That's all I have. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.